The aim of this video to draw your attention to the numerous inconsistencies regarding Shakespeare's authorship of his alleged play Pericles. The play first appeared as quarter one in 1609. You should know that only some months earlier, also in London, in 1608, a prose noveler about Pericles, entitled, The Painful Adventures of Pericles, Prince of Tyre, was written with stunning congruent contents, by a rather unknown author, George Wilkins. It seems neither plausible, likely nor logical, that two obviously so different personalities, the towering Shakespeare and the unknown Wilkins, within months, in the same city of London, had worked on identical literary material. That makes no reasonable sense. Shakespeare's play, as well as Wilkins' novel, clearly are based on John Gower's poem, Confessio Amantis. There, we clearly find the main outline, the names of places and characters, and several passages of the play. Shakespeare named the narrator of his play Gower. Wilkins illustrated Gower on the title page. Grotesquely, as you read in Wikipedia, modern textual studies and editors generally agree that Shakespeare is responsible for the second half of the play Pericles. Whereas the first half, Act 1 and 2, detailing the many voyages of Pericles was written by a collaborator, George Wilkins. This view should be seen as a disastrous literary aberration. One can only fully agree with Eric Sam's reasonable conclusions. A and B. A. Documentary evidence permits only one hypothesis properly so called, namely that Pericles was indeed an early play of the true, Shakespeare, which he later revised. B. The true Shakespeare rewrote nobody's plays but his own. Fourteen years earlier, in 1594, a very similar literary story, also related to painful adventures of a prince, was already composed and printed, but by an author, named Lawrence Twine who leaned closer to Gower's English poem, Confessio Amantis, since he used Gower's protagonist names, Prince Apollonius as Pericles, Lady Lucina as Taser, Athenagoras as Lysimachus, and so on. To complicate it even further, the painful adventures from 1594 were reprinted in 1607 again. But stunningly the author Lawrence Twine had now changed to Tea Twine. Twine, a double pun? Two twined, or twisted literary compositions, a novel and a play? Two twined, or twisted composers, William Shakespeare and George Wilkins? The most logical explanation for these strange inconsistencies. Shakespeare's supposed massive plagiarism, and his contextual overlaps with Wilkins' novelas on Pericles and Pyrocles, and on Twine's Apollonius, can logically best, and only be understood and interpreted as earlier, strongly autobiographical, allegoric literary counterparts of a singular hidden, multi-pseudonymous author after his banishment and exile in 1593, who eventually invented, that is, remodeled, dramatized and printed Gower's literary source in 1608-09, pretty tricky is his own late dramatic situation, as Pericles, by adding multiple, astonishing autobiographical insights.
Note. Pericles is Shakespeare's only quarto play, with his first and last name printed on the title page, separated by two opposed header symbols. The symbol is a piece of punctuation, primarily found in early Latin and Greek texts. The most likely and logical explanation would be, to signal, in 1609, a break, that is, a non-identity between the first name, William, and the last name, Shakespeare. Thus most likely disclosing an early contemporary authorship issue, and the possible reason, why Pericles was not allowed, to be printed in the first folio. You may ask, why Shakespeare or Wilkins had renamed the main character Apollonius, to Pericles. It is highly likely, that the true Shakespeare used Pericles as one of his many word puns. He changed to the name Pericles, to interweave the stormy character of the hero Pyrocles, in Philip Sidney's The Countess of Pembroke's Arcadia with the calm Greek statesman and rhetorician Pericles. In a letter of May 24, 1619, to Sir Dudley Carlton, Sir Gerard Herbert mentions a performance of a play Pirocles at court. Philip Sidney's Arcadia has been revised several times. It has been speculated whether this happened through Philip's sister Mary Sidney, Countess of Pembroke, who intended to clean the manuscript of erotic parts. It is noteworthy, in any case, that multiple literary connections can be established between Mary Sidney and Marlowe, but virtually none with William Shakespeare from Stratford. Can anybody really believe, that Marlowe's chosen own Latin life motto, painted on his portrait in 1585, with its text, Quod me nutrit, me distrut? appeared accidentally in Wilkins' novella, as well as in Shakespeare's play? It seems literally not possible, to imagine, that William from Stratford embraced Marlowe's complementary philosophy of life. It seems much more likely and plausible, that Marlowe, the true Shakespeare, was hiding behind his own complementary life motto, as in Sonnet 73 consumed with that it was nourished by, or in Coriolanus, who deserves greatness, deserves your hate, and in numerous other of his pseudonymous works, such as the emblem poetry books of Geoffrey Whitney, of George Wither, or Aviza and Plementueo. You should be fully aware, as the title page of Shakespeare's Pericles clearly announces, that Shakespeare's play Pericles should be interpreted as the autobiographic disclosure of the author's, the true Shakespeare's, history, and fortune. You will learn decisive features about the background, of the whole history and fortunes of Pericles, that is the true Shakespeare. You will learn amazing, unmistakable details about Marlowe's renunciation of his own identity, about his own agreements with his superior, William Cecil, as Antiochus, about his motives of escape, and so on. Be fully aware, there is no getting around. The true and real Shakespeare clearly unveils in his quarto play Pericles, Prince of Tyre, his autobiographical key decisions, and motives, during the early period of his own life disaster. Since there exists hardly any evidence of Marlowe's concealed life in exile, the reflections and travelings in the first acts on Pericles, offer an impressive opportunity to learn essential information about the psychology, mental state, and inner thoughts of the true Shakespeare, at the early period of his life catastrophe, his survival, and his exile. In Pericles, Act 1, 
the given autobiographical contexts, A, to K, are more unveiling, than in any other of Shakespeare's plays. This can explain the fact, why Pericles had to be withheld and could not be published in the first folio. Let us read and understand essential unmasking, astonishing far-reaching autobiographical confessions, from selected extensive extracts, part A, to K, in Pericles Act I. Which, up to now, were considered to be strange inconsistencies and inexplicabilities, as long as a Shakespeare Marlowe identity could not be thought or be conceived. The prologue of the first act sets unmistakable accents, similar to an agenda. Can anybody really deny, that this is autobiographical? The author, through the narrator, Gower, announces to the audience, what he intends in Pericles. 1. Later generations, riper, may accept his rhymes, that is, understand his life events. 2. In Pericles, he will present his own, fatal life. 3. And justify the causes, of his puzzling, mysterious life situation. In more details. Scene 1 in Act 1, can be read as the representation of the actual historical events of Marlowe. He had come into conflict with the law and was charged with high treason and rebellion. He was given the opportunity to save his life through a risky, imposed measure. 1. Young Prince of Tyre, you have received at large the danger of the task, you undertake. He accepts the advice to dare, to venture out and assumes, that there will be no danger for him. 2. Emboldened with the glory of her praise, think death, no hazard in this enterprise. If the venture fails, he wants to kill himself, he will obey as a servant and son. 3. Or die in the adventure, be my helps, as I am son and servant to your will. Something like that must have happened to Marlowe in May 1593, when he was exposed to massive accusations from the Crown and Church, threatened with the death penalty. The monarch, as William Cecil, explained to him, how fates like his own, have happened in the past. Princes like himself were attracted by the desire for risk, and by adventurous reports. For, yon sometimes famous princes, like thyself, drawn by the report, adventurous by desire. And made him believe, he could save the firmament, the world, without protection. 5. That without covering, save the yon field of stars. Others thought the same and were executed as martyrs for it. 6. Here they stand martyrs, slain in Cupid's wars. Their dead cheeks warned him to give up. 7. And with dead cheeks, advise thee, to desist. Otherwise he would end up. 8. For going on death's net, whom none resist. Can anyone really assume, that these are no autobiographical hints of the true Shakespeare? Cecil's message to Marlowe at the time, when he had to face the deadly threat in May 1593, was likely to have been, to abandon his incendiary ideas. He must have been grateful to William Cecil, for helping him to survive and to understand his own fragile finiteness. 1. I thank thee, who hath taught my frail mortality to know itself. And by the sight of those terrifying separated heads, it became clear to him, what he had to do. 2. And by those fearful objects to prepare this body, like to them, to what I must. With death in front of his eyes, which was held up to him, like a mirror. 3. For death remembered should be like a mirror. He became aware of the difference between life and death. 4. Who tells us, life is but a breath, to trust it error. 
as it would happen to the sick, who as soon as they see death approaching, only feel their need. This passage marks Marlowe's decision, not to follow the path, shown by the martyrs. He chose the other way, which is both the riddle and the secret. He became a broken man, who had understood the course of necessities, who felt his need. 5. And, as sick men do, who know the world, see heaven, but, feeling woe, and who through the loss of his identity, renounced his name to earthly joys. 6. Make my will, gripe not at earthly joys, as first, they did. He renounced and left as a legacy a peaceful peace. 7. So I bequeath the happy peace to you. And left the people, in the manner of a prince, his property. 8. As every prince should do, my riches to the earth, from whence they came. He knows since he has understood the riddle, which path to take, between, to be, or not to be. 9. Thus ready for the way of life or death. And was also aware of his upcoming hard fate. 10. I wait for the sharpest blow. The poet knows, how to master the superficial level of the play, as well as constructing a deeper, hidden level of his biographical situation. Superficially, he deals with a narrative commonplace. He has to solve a riddle, in order to survive, in a plain language he has to accept the monarch's Cecil's offer. His life-saving riddle, could only be made possible by splitting his person, changing his identity, and abandon his name. This is made clear by the end of the riddle. And yet in two, as you will live, resolve it you. As a result of his life decision, he received a new identity with false names as the author, for example Shakespeare, but as a person, he had to remain in the dark and unknown. Since he wants to live, he had to resolve the division for himself. A seemingly impossible riddle. What a contradictive dialectic situation. To reward somebody with his daughter, forgetting his own crime. Believe to or not, it is the metaphor of the true author's own life situation. Protecting allegorically his hidden and forbidden self-threatening situation of a spiritual incestuous affinity with his own muse. Nobody is allowed to know about this secret of double existence. Antiochus, William Cecil, explains to Pericles outright, that he would have forfeited his life on the basis of the statutes. He should expound himself. 1. For that's an article within our law, as dangerous as the rest. Your time is expired, either expand now or receive your sentence. On a second, deeper level, the true Shakespeare accommodates the riddle of his own fate. He knows that his identity split, the pretense of his death could not have succeeded without the support of the crown and authorities. But he also knows that the crown does not like to reveal its own complicity. 2. Few love to hear the sins, they love to act. He was able to save his head, because of his high poetic linguistic talent. 3. Then give my tongue like leave to love my head. He was too much involved in the invention, that had led him to change his identity and name, and faint death, in order to be able to talk about it. 4. To braid yourself too near for me, to tell it. Talking about the monarchy's misdeeds would have been dangerous. 5. Who has a book of all, that monarchs do, he is more secure to keep it shut than shown. Repeated vices would spread like a wandering wind. 6. For vice repeated, is like the wandering wind. The rumor would accuse others and spread. 7. Blows dust in others' eyes, to spread itself. In the end, 
If he talked about it, everything would be bought too dearly. 8. And yet the end of all is bought thus, dear. When the wind has subsided and you realize. 9. The breath is gone, and the sore eyes see clear. How could you have prevented the rumor, you would damage others with it. 10. To stop the air would hurt them. Since an informants always leave traces. 11. The blind mole casts cocktails towards heaven. Betrays himself and has to die for it. 12. To tell the earth is thronged by man's oppression, and the poor worm does die for it. Ultimately, the monarchs would have the power. They subordinate laws to their will. 13. Kings are earth's gods, in a vice, their law is their will. And if the monarch is wrong, who would dare to contradict? 14. And if Jove stray, who dares say Jove doth fill? He could not and should not talk about it, it must be enough if one knows it and knows how it fits in. 15. It is enough you know, and it is fit. What is known to too many people, spreads faster, and then it cannot be caught again. 16. What being more known grows worse, to smother it. Since he loved his being born so much in the context of rebirth. 17. All love the womb that their first being bred. All that remained for him, was that his rebirth at least left the talent for the formulation so that one could further appreciate his spirit. 3 Then give my tongue like leave to love my head. Marlowe must have thought up himself the solution to the riddle, of his life conflict, the splitting of his identity, the monarch notices this when he expresses. 1 Heaven, that I had thy brain. William Cecil is likely to have glossed over the necessity for Marlowe's identity change by persuasion. 2. But I will glows with him. When he explains to him that according to the strict statutes, of the law, the decision could have been made differently. 3. Though by the tenor of our strict edict, your exposition misinterpreting. He could have continued to end his days. 4. We might proceed to cancel of your days. Yet he hopes to coordinate with him by showing the appropriate way his virtue go. 5. Yet hope, succeeding from so fair a tree, as your fair self, doth tune us otherwise. In the end, he leaves the future open for forty days. 6. Forty days longer we do respite you. Should the secret of the conspiracy and the change of identity by then not to be revealed? 7. If by which time our secret be undone. The grace of his life will show that he, Cecil, reason to enjoy such a son. 8. This mercy shows we will enjoy in such a son. Until then, his demand will be. 9. And until then your entertain shall be that he face him and his own talent, accordingly behave appropriately. 10. As doth befit our honour and your worth. The real and true Shakespeare uses the protagonist Pericles to reveal his mental state during his exile in detail and it seems hard to imagine, that he could have portrayed him so authentically if he had not had such experiences himself for the dramatic progression of the play alone, the long reflections are hardly necessary, and often even counterproductive. Since we do not possess any evidence of the true author Shakespeare's life, the reflections on Pericles offer an unprecedented opportunity to learn more about the mental state and thoughts of the true Shakespeare in his critical period of life. In Pericles, the autobiographical contexts are more unveiling, than in any other of the Bard's plays.
Pericles worries about the consequences of his escape and does not feel safe in exile either. He realizes that since he lived in exile, his perspective has changed and he has become increasingly depressive. 1. Why should his change of thoughts? 2. The sad companion, dull eyed melancholy, 3. By me so used a guest. Melancholy has become his constant guest which does not allow him to rest for an hour of the day or night. For as not an hour, in the day's glorious walk or peaceful night, that would otherwise bury his worries. 5. The tomb where grief should sleep, can breed me quiet. Although he enjoyed many things in his exile, he avoided these joys. 6. Here pleasures caught mine eyes and mine eyes shunned them. He knew that the dangers that threatened and frightened him at home. 7. And danger, which I feared, is at Antioch. It could not affect him in exile. 8. Whose arm seems far too short to hit me here. Yet neither art could please his mind. 9. Yet neither pleasures art can joy my spirits. Nor did the distance of others comfort him. 10. Nor yet the others distance comfort. Me. Marlowe comes out with a key conclusion, at a time, when he was threatened with death, in 1593, he felt naked fear. This feeling had changed in the meantime. He explains this with the fact, that the sufferings of his spirit, which had their origin initially in the sheer horror of death. 11. The passions of the mind that had their first conception by misdread. Meanwhile were caused and kept alive by another sorrow would. 12. Have after nourishment and life by care. What originally represented a state of pure fear for him, in which he did not know how to act. 13. And what was first but fear what might be done. Gradually turned into a state of conscious sadness, that it would never have happened. 14. Grows elder now and cares it be not done. That is, what really happened to him. 15. And so with me. He himself was too insignificant to compete with the powerful leader, W. Cecil. 16. The great monarch, Antiochus, against whom I am. Too little to contend. Who could always put his will into practice. 17. Since he's so great can make his will. His act. Cecil could assume that he, Pericles, would divulge their mutual secret, although he had sworn to remain silent. 18. Will think me speaking, though I swear to silence. If Cecil would suspect his dishonor. 19. If he suspects I may dishonor him. It wouldn't be worth assuring him that he adores him. 20. Nor boots it me to say I honor him. What a compelling and powerful disclosure of autobiographical key details from the author. During his initial exile. Even in exile, Marlowe, as Pericles ponders, what could happen, if something became known? What could anger Cecil? 21. And what may make him blush in being known? Cecil would certainly block every way, through which it could become known. 22. He'll stop the course, by which it might be known, and he would cover the country with unfriendly violence. 23. With hostile forces, he'll overspread the land. Threatening signals would make him appear so powerful. 24. And with the ostent of war, will look so huge. That all courage would be scared away in the country. 25. Amazement shall drive courage from the state. People would be defeated before they could even offer resistance. 26. Our men are vanquished ere they do resist. And innocents would be punished who had never thought of a crime. 
27. And subjects punished that near thought offense. Who would care for these people, who would have mercy on him? 28. Which care of them, not pity of myself. To whom he himself only represents that, tree, crown. 29. Who am no more but as the tops of trees. That protected the roots from which they grew. 30. Which fenced the roots they grow by and defend them. All these thoughts consumed him, let his spirit wither. 31. Makes both my body pine and soul to languish and punished in advance what should punish him. 32. And punish that before that he would punish. Dash. The friends, Helicanus, lords, can be understood as the poets in a defense against his gloomy thoughts. He is admired. He is wished for joy and consolation on his sacred breast. 33. Joy and all comfort in your sacred breast. And is advised to keep in mind that he should remain peaceful and serene until he can return home. 34. And keep your mind, till you return to us, peaceful and comfortable. He should definitely keep calm, peace, peace and put all his eloquence into his words, and texts. 35. And give experienced tongue. His words should occupy the king by flattering him. 36. They do abuse the king that flatter him. Because his flattering would work as a gentle wind on the crime. 37. For flattery is the bellows blows up sin. The object with which he flatters him needs only be a spark. 38 The thing which is flattered, but a spark. Which kindles more heat and demers in the king? 39 To which that blast gives heat and stronger glowing. A devoted, appropriate reproach befits the kings since they too are people who could a. Uh, 40 While reproof, obedient and in order fits kings. 41. As they are men, for they may err. Uh, Pericles did not know how to decide in the future, even in exile. When asking his advisors, what they would do in his place. 42. What wouldst thou have me do, he is always advised to be patient with his worries, for which he himself is to blame. 43. To bear with patience such griefs as you yourself do lay upon yourself, he explains once more that death looked him in the face at home. 45. Attend me, then, I went to Antioch where as you know, against the face of death, since the monarch was gentle and not grim with him, he became suspicious and felt fear, and sensed threat, when he appeared to be kissing him, great fear arose. 49, seemed not to strike, but smooth, but thou knowst this, it is time to fear, when tyrants seem to kiss, thus he left the country in the protecting obscurity. 50 which fear so grew in me, I hither fled, under the covering of careful night. These words suggest, that Marlow did not have to leave England, but that he did so of his own free will, because of his fear of Cecil's increasing unpredictability. In exile, he thought about, what had actually happened and what might follow. 51, and, being here, bethought me what was past, what might succeed. Before, he had seen Cecil Tyrannus. 52a, I knew him tyrannous. And he was aware, that tyrants' fears increased with age. 52b, and tyrants' fears decrease not, but grow faster than the years, the monarch would, no doubt, suspect. 53a, and should he do it, as he doubtlessly doth, that he, pericles could spread rumors. 53b, that I should open to the listening ear, 
what a noble prince he had on his conscience. 54a, how many worthy princes' bloods were shed? To make his relationship, to the church, seem immaculate. 54b, to keep his bed of blackness unlaid open. To cut all such doubts, Cecil, if the plot came out, would arm the country. 55, to lop that doubt, he will fill this land with arms. And pretend that Marlowe played along with him. 56, and make the pretense of wrong, that I have done him. He has a thousand doubts. 56, musings into my mind, with thousand doubts. And does not know, how to stop this storm of thoughts, before it even begins. 57, how I might stop this tempest before it came. And finds little consolation to alleviate his doubts. 58, and finding little comfort to relieve them. His advisers, his complimentary voices believe they see that he must be rightly afraid of England. 60, freely will I speak. Antiochus you fear and justly too, I think, you. And that you can get it publicly or through secret betrayal. 61, who either, by public war or private treason, could seek his life. 62, a, will take away your life. They, therefore, advise him, to flee again to an unknown place for a longer period of time. 62 b, therefore, my lord, go travel for a while. Until the regent's anger and anger are forgotten. 63, till that his rage and anger be forgotten. Or until fate ended the regent's life. 64, or till the destinies do cut his thread of life. Pericles decides, to change his current whereabouts again and move to Tarsus. 65, I now look from thee then, and to Tarsus. He wants to make his further path dependent on what he learns from his friends. 66, intend my travel, where I'll hear from thee, and from which. From news, he will make his decisions dependent. 67 And by whose letters I'll dispose of myself. Marlowe must obviously have always felt a great fear of being tracked down and persecuted by the English crown with its sophisticated intelligence service, even on the mainland. All these frank autobiographical textual indications give us an idea of why the play Pericles could not be included in the first or second folio. Can anybody really believe, that the shadowy, obscure figure, George, Wilkins, an alleged innkeeper, involved in criminal activities, is identical with the author of those sophisticated works, of miseries, jests, travels, adventures, in 1606-1608, who all can be brought into direct, or indirect relations with works of, Shakespeare, 